السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته إن الحمد لله نحمده ونستعينه ونستغفره ونعوذ بالله من شرور أنفسنا ومن سيئات أعمالنا من يهده الله فلا مضل له ومن يضل فلا هادي له وأشهد أن لا إله إلا الله وحده لا شريك له وأشهد أن محمدًا عبد الله ورسوله صلى الله عليه وعلى آله وصحبه وسلم يا أيها الذين آمنوا اتقوا الله حق تقاته ولا تبوتن إلا وأنتم مسلمون يا أيها الناس اتقوا ربكم الذي خلقكم من نفس واحدة وخلق منها زوجها وبث منهما رجالا كثيرا ونساء واتقوا الله الذي تساءلون به والأرحام إن الله كان عليكم رقيبا يا أيها الذين آمنوا اتقوا الله وقولوا قولا سديدا يُصِّح لكم أعمالكم ويغفِر لكم ذنوبكم ومن يُطِع الله ورسوله فقد فاز فوزا عظيما أما بعد Always and forever we begin with the praise of Allah We send our prayers of peace upon the Nabi Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam We testify with firmness and conviction that none is worthy of worship but Allah and that Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is his worshipping slave and final messenger I always remind myself and you of taqwa Allah azza wa jal and I pray that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala makes that taqwa, that inner piety, that seeking of righteousness to be more private to us in greater capacity than that which we seek to display and dramatize to others, Allahumma ameen. First, I would like to thank the organizers of this conference and all of those who are in attendance, the ulama who have visited from far and wide, jazahumullah khair. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala record for them the miles and the footsteps that they've arrived here in their scales on the day of judgment. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala return them and us all safely to our families. Allahumma ameen. The word success is a really contentious word. And it's important to add a bit of nuance to it. See, success for one person may be failure to another. Success is something that is assessed metrically, meaning it's scalable. And if I was to ask you, you know, how successful are you in your academic pursuits? You could say, I have this degree, this degree, or you could say, I've accomplished it, not just a degree, but from this particular prestigious university. So I'm more successful in that sense. If I ask you about success in terms of your prosperity and wealth, you can say, I have this much in my bank, this is where my home is situated, it's in this desirable neighborhood, this is the cost that my car is worth. If I ask you about the success of your family and home and your children, it's metric, it's by, you know, you could, you could measure it on a scale. However, contentment and happiness, which sometimes we conflate as being one and the same thing, is totally separate. And sometimes the success of one person is a destroying source of unhappiness for someone else. Sometimes I got my daughter married. Sometimes my son, I put him in engineering. And the son drops out of university two years later because he doesn't want to be an engineer. She didn't want to be married to this particular person. Divorce ensues. Children, I want my child to memorize the whole Qur'an and I'm going to put him, I'm going to take him out of school and put him in the Qur'an. I want him to be a success and a hafiz. And there are many who have gathered the Qur'an, some who studied with me in Egypt, in Canada, in Saudi Arabia. There are people who I considered personal friends and I still reach out to them as much as I can who know more than me, some know more than me and had a greater academic success than me. But it did not profit them because it wasn't a source of contentment and happiness. And therefore there's this struggle. And there must be this struggle. What you notice when you look in the seerah of the Prophet ﷺ is that not all of the Sahaba were warriors. Not all of the Sahaba 
were philanthropists. Not all of the Sahaba were fuqaha. Not all of the Sahaba memorized the Quran. Not all of the Sahaba reached the excellence in things that you and I also want to reach excellence and mastery in. And sometimes they would worry about themselves. They would think themselves lesser than other people. And my talk with you today isn't just about success or happiness. It's about balance. It's about finding the balance in life that allows us to reach happiness without loss of success, worldly or in the hereafter. It's about reaching success without compromising on contentment of the heart and the spirit and the soul. It's about having a success that others should not judge us by and more importantly, that we don't scale others by what we want for ourselves. There's a beautiful hadith of the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. It's a hadith you would have heard in Jumu'ah khutbahs often. And sometimes, you know, the words of the Prophet Sallallahu when they're translated to us and they're shared with us, the complete picture isn't shown. And one of those hadith, you know, it's, it's a hadith that when our ulama, they teach it, they spend time with it. I remember a Sheikh Muhammad Safwad Nur al-Din, Rahmatullahi Alayhi. He was the head of Ansar al-Sunnah and one of my primary teachers in Egypt. And I remember studying this hadith and it was such a powerful lesson in my life. And it's the hadith of Al-Mu'min, the believer is the mirror of another. Al-Mu'min, mir'at akhi, the believer is a mirror image of his brother, of others in society. And usually we think that hadith, oh, it's about brotherhood, mashallah, we connect with each other. We're like, we look out into society, we want to see people who are like us. And that's not the truth, the only truth of the hadith. See, whenever you look in a mirror, and sisters, mashallah, they probably have more difficulty with this than others. You know, you always, your wife, mashallah, she'll probably stand there pinning her scarf, and she'll put the pin, she'll, say, she'll look in the mirror, no, it's not right. There's that arc, you know, there's that curve. You know, it drives my wife crazy. Now I gotta iron it again. She irons it, I don't know, and she'll blow at it, trying to keep it up somehow, right? It bothers her. When you look in a mirror, it's about criticism. It's not about finding perfection, it's about finding fault. What the Prophet ﷺ is implicitly saying, when you look out into the world and you see something disfigured, something imperfect, something ugly, something that needs to change, it doesn't begin with them, it begins with, with you. You don't like what you see? You don't like what you see out there? What have you done about it? What, wh whose hand have you held on to to bring a change? What petitioning are you involved in? What voluntary associations have you committed yourself to? Have you spoken out? Have you written letters? Have you gone to meetings? Have you attended classes? Have you stood up to be counted? Have you registered yourself proudly in a census as a Muslim? Like what, what have you done to change what you think is ugly? You don't like what you see but it's a reflection of you. So you don't like that brother who lied to you and cheated you and sold you that car? Hold on a second, do you remember yourself a couple of years ago? Do you remember some of the dodgy things you used to do? MashaAllah, now you've grown a beard, you wore the hijab, you're, you're MashaAllah, you're a, you're a practicing Muslim now? You think now you're, you're successful? You think, khalas, MashaAllah, I made it? I attend the courses, I go to the classes, I, I've memorized a little bit of Quran? MashaAllah, I've changed my life. Al-Imam Ahmed, he reports a powerful hadith. And it should be a foundation of our da'wah. Al-Imam Ahmed, he reports a hadith of Abu Hurair radiallahu anhu. It's a sahih hadith and it's reported by others. The Prophet sallam, at times was a storyteller. You know, one of uh, my teacher's books, it's called uh, the Qisas that the Prophet narrated, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Uh, Sheikh Abu Shaq Al-Huwani has a book, I've been translating it, it's almost done. It's about the stories the Prophet told the Sahaba. The hadith usually begins, كَانَ فِي مَنْ كَانَ قَبْلَكُمْ There was a time before our time, in the time of those who lived before us. رَجُولًا 
Two men who became like blood brothers in their love for one another. One of them was, mashallah, mujtahid. He was a prayer, a worshiper, a charitable giver, a hajj, everything. He pushed further than the envelope allowed. He did everything that was needed and more. His best friend, who he treated better than a blood brother, Muqsir, was held back, was a little bit of a sinner, didn't do the right thing, didn't, you know, wasn't a person who you would say is a successful Muslim. فَقَالَ الْمُجْتَهِدْ The Prophet is narrating their story. فَقَالَ الْمُجْتَهِدْ You know, this is in the time of our cousins in faith, the Jews and the Christians, before the Prophet ﷺ. فَقَالَ الْمُجْتَهِدْ The righteous one, the one we think is right, he would say to the sinner, أَقْصِرْ Stop it. فَإِنَّ اللَّهَ لَا يَغْفِرُ لَكَ أَبَدًا What you're doing, Allah will never forgive. وَلَا يُدْخِلَكَ الْجَنَّةِ My Lord will never allow you to step foot in Jannah. You're never going to be successful. You're never going to make it. Look how you live your life. Take me as your example. I'm a good guy. The Prophet ﷺ says, فَمَاتَ Eventually they die. فَجَمَعَهُمُ اللَّهِ فَحُشِرَ جَمْعًا they are gathered on the Day of Judgment. The Prophet foretells what will happen. And Allah will bring the two together for their hisab, their day of accounting. This really good mujtahid and this really sinful one. The sinful one used to say to his friend, Khalli bayni wa bayna Rabbi. Hey, let me be with my Lord. I know who I am. I know I'm a sinner. Leave me to my Lord. My God, Allah, your Lord and mine didn't make you my watcher over. You're not my policeman. You're not meant or destined to tell me do this or don't. It's not your job. And when they're gathered on the day of judgment, the Prophet ﷺ says that Allah will speak to the righteous man, the mujtahid man, and say to him, Aqad malaktaka amri, did I give you my power? That you can decide who's in Jannah, whose mercy is given, who isn't? Did I give you this authority? Aqad utita ilman minni, or did I give you some special knowledge, some secret book with the names of the people of Jannah that you have the audacity to say you are excluded from it? And Allah turns to the sinful man and says, "Abdi, qad ghafartu lak. My sinning servant, I've forgiven you. Enter Jannah. Wa anna lak al nar, but you." who put that despair in people's heart, who thought that success was just metric, that the more I do, it's gonna definitely be accepted, that you're measuring others by a, a yardstick that Allah didn't give you. But for you, enter Jahannam, hellfire, until you're purified from the despair you put in people's heart. Balance. Subhanallah. How needy we are of these words with our young children, our teenagers as they mature. How needy we are with our neighbors. How needy we are with people who know and who don't know about right and wrong, who we seek to put in a scale, a measure, that we assume we know true and only success. Success and happiness, my dear brothers and sisters, the providence on the day of judgment you seek is based on the deeds we work here, but more importantly, on the rahmah of Allah Azza wa Jal. And if you cannot show compassion to those who live amongst you on earth, how do you expect the one above the heavens to show it to you? You know, I had one brother. He said to me, uh, Sheikh Yahya, when I die, I want you to make my janazah. I want you to make my ghusl. Make my jannah. I said, Ya Akhi, may Allah give you a long life. He said, No, 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 I want to give you my wasi because I want you to remember this. You see, you know that brother? I was trying to help them solve a problem. They had a problem over money, little money, not big money. You know that brother? You know the one we. I said, Yes. 
He said, when I die, if I die, when I die, and you make my janazah, the reason I want you for janazah, not because you're special. Jazallah khair. Is so that you remember these words. If you see him come into the masjid to pray for me, kick him out. Allahu Akbar. Look at, look at this. Uh, look at this heart. That heart is going to stand to Allah in Ramadan and say, Rabbi ghfirli, my Lord, forgive me. I want success in the akhirah. And it can't have any mercy with another person, even if he wronged you, ya akhi. You know, what, you know what's missing sometimes in our communities? That, you know, when we talk about the rahmah, it's significant. Someone borrowed from me, just say $2,000. They said next year, I pay. they don't pay me. Two years later, they didn't pay me. Three years, four years go by. And then he's sick in hospital. What's his haq? What's his haq? That I visit him. He owes me money, but that's separate. His daughter is getting married, and I'm invited. I go. You know, sometimes you say, Wallahi, I will never go. If you see him in Eid, you turn your face. Over $2,000. And then you say, Ya Rabbi, Ya Rabb. Ya Rabb. I want success, Ya Rabb. In the dunya, Ya Rabbi, give me rizq, Ya Rabb. The heart is important. So I want to conclude in these last six, seven minutes that I have with you. And I know, subhanAllah, it's been a long day. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala reward you for your endurance and patience. By giving five points from the sunnah of the Prophet sallallahu that bring a healing to the heart, balance to life, and hope for success in the akhirah. The first of them is to hold on to the Qur'an. Now when I say hold on to the Qur'an, I know there are brothers who spoke about the Qur'an earlier. What I mean is, you know, I know a man, I'm not going to say who it is, some of you might know. He's 70 years old now, 72 actually. He just finished memorizing the Qur'an, mashallah. Spring chicken, yani fresh. 72 years old. You say, oh. Oh, that's strange. No, wallahi, that's not strange. Muhammad وسلم, finished the Quran 60 plus. Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. The last verses were in the last years of his life. The Sahaba, they memorized the Quran over 23 years. The Quran was revealed until the final years of the Prophet. وسلم, right? The Quran is a lifelong journey. Ya Akhi, you're 25, 30, 40 years now. You have, inshallah, may Allah give you another 30, 40 years. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala give you half a page, half an ayah every day, every week. May your niyyah be to always progress in the Qur'an until death suddenly comes to you. Success in the Qur'an. Qur'an isn't for little kids. Wallahi, it annoys me sometimes, you know. I'm sure Sheikh Burhan, mashallah, he's from Perth. He has a Qur'an school. I'm sure he hates it as much as do when the parents come, they drop their kids off and then they sit in the car, read the newspaper. Ya Akhi, what are you doing? Oh, I'm waiting for the... Ya Akhi, read the Qur'an with... Oh no, this is for kids, brother. We have this mentality that our kids learn, but it's not for us now. Khalas, I'm a big man. What I know is what I know. La, connect with the Qur'an. Number two, give. Yani, when I say give, I don't mean give one person in particular, one group in particular, give one for one thing in particular, something bad happen. No, make it as a general habit in life. The one who asks, don't turn him away with nothing. There's always something you give, even if all you can give is a smile. Look at the words of the Prophet ﷺ. One of the most profound words is that of Shaykh al-Islam ibn al-Qayyim. He says that the one who doesn't have the wealth to give sadaqah, sadaqah to another human being. You, you can't buy someone, you know, bread. You don't have money to buy someone bread. Let him take from his own bread crumbs and give it in charity to an ant. Allahu Akbar. Look at how they think about charity. You can't help me? Help, help an ant, ya akhi. Help a cat. 
a woman was released from Jahannam for no other reason, a sinful woman. For no other reason, the Prophet ﷺ says, and in another narration, a sinful man for no other reason, except that they gave water to an animal, a dog or a cat. I forgive everything, subhanahu wa ta'ala. Number three, open your heart to those who your mind wants to close it to. You know, you have to battle yourself. There are some people, subhanAllah, you look at them, you don't like them. Yeah, and I don't know what's wrong with the brother. He just looks wrong. I don't know why I can't be friends with him. That's the kind of guy you need to open your heart to. Sister, open your heart that you find the capacity to love other people, Muslim or not. Muslim or not. Our faith was not exclusionary in that sense. You had many of the Sahaba of the Prophet ﷺ who married, you know, women who were non-Muslim. Abdullah ibn Umar was one example of them. Radiallahu anhu wa arda. That you can find love with other things and other people, other places. And we have to be able to open our heart for those who at times that we find it difficult. You know, my mother-in-law, Jazallah khair, we had a neighbor who moved in. He was rough looking. You know, sometimes you get a new neighbor and you look and you say, Allahu Akbar, Allahumma salli ala Muhammad. You start reading Ayatul Kursi. Is that kind of neighbor? And you're like, what's going on? And she says, she's, she went in the kitchen, she started to make baklawa. She's Turkish. It's a natural thing for her to do. So she's making this Turkish chocolate baklawa. Not that, you know, nice stuff. She rolls it out herself and everything. And she finishes it. I thought she was making it for me. She goes, uh, here, take it over to them. I go to who? That guy? La 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 la. She goes, yeah, yeah, take it over. When a sheikh, yani I should know better. I go over, but they had left. They went to buy something. So there I am in their front yard, and I'm bending over near their front door. They have boxes and things they left. And they drive in. He thinks I'm robbing them. He thinks I'm bent over, like rummaging through their boxes. He goes, hey, man, what are you doing? I said, I had batlawa. <laughs> he goes, what's that? I go, it's food. <laughs> It's sweets. His wife says, it's that Lebanese stuff. I said, no, it's Turkish. She take, oh, thank you. Uh, you're okay, thank you. The next morning I open my door, I'm going out to work. There's a big slab, 36 cans of beer. He's trying to thank me, right? I gave him batlawa, he's giving me any, his batlawa. He invites us to a barbecue, we invite him to, I say, listen, we don't eat, you know, we, we have halal meat. He goes, that funny meat? I go, yeah, the funny meat. I go, it's nice. He bought, he, he, so now, he, now his whole family's converted to funny meat. All they bought is halal because it tastes nice, smells nice, mashallah. Yeah, he open your heart. Number four, your wife is your life. And I say this to the brothers. Because subhanAllah, sometimes as married men, we kind of forget how difficult it is for the sisters. And as much as you think it's difficult out there in the world and on and on, you know, you haven't walked out in a shopping center with a hijab on. You haven't gone out throughout the day, stood at a red light where people abuse you and on and on and on. And sadly, this is a part of society which we look out as a mirror and we have to begin with ourselves to fix it. We got to be more active. So have rahmah on your wife, ya akhi. The Prophet ﷺ overwhelmingly puts the blame on the men rather than the women. You always hear the hadith of the Prophet, istawsu bin nisa'ikha, treat your women well, treat your... You don't hear istawsu bin rijali khayra, treat your man well, no. It's usually treat your woman well. Why? Because there's a negligence with us. And sometimes the way hadith are translated, it, it, it caused in us a misunderstanding. You get this hadith, it's in Sahih Muslim. It says that the, you know, the woman was created from a rib. And the way they translated the rib, uh, you know, it's ma'wug, uh, it's got a crookedness. Yani, she's a serpent. Instead of saying that the rib is elevated, changes the meaning. It changes the context. The rib is elevated. And if you try to straighten it, you will break it. Sheikh Abu Sahaq, he says the woman is curved in that area, elevated. 
فَأَنْتَ تَمِيلُ عَلَيْهَا So that you can curve upon her and enjoy her that way. Subhanallah. Changes the meaning from when you say crooked to elevated. Allahumma salli ala Muhammadin wa ali Muhammad. So curve over your wife. Lean into your wife. Hug your wife. Be a part of her life, ya akhi. Fifth and finally, the red screen has flashed. Your children. On the day of judgment, your child is a question mark in your life. How you brought them up, how you raised them, how you loved them, how you nurtured them, what experiences that you've shared with them. There's a difference between being together and sitting near each other. Sometimes as parents, we always say, I'm always with my kids. No, you're near your kids, but you're not with your kids. Sitting and reading and mobile while they're playing in your room is not with your kids. You're just near your kids. Your children need you with them. And such are the words of our Nabi Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa sallim. This is the sunnah that leads us to the path of Jannah. I ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to give us success and happiness in this life and in the akhirah. To raise amongst us those who are in front of us who will stand before us as teachers. Allahumma ameen. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala heal the hearts and open our hearts to other people in society and have their hearts open towards us. May bridges be extended between us and our broader community. May whatever misunderstandings that are there be eliminated by the goodwill that we seek for one another. And may we be at the forefront of solving whatever problems there are in society. وصلي اللهم وسلم وزد وبارك على سيدنا وحبيبنا ونبينا محمد صلى الله عليه وعلى آله وصحبه وسلم.